Vän vet jag in i zergajen Och du är zankran Bechal jag i machak eloj Vi vän går ni smid Bräng jag i moshiach vän du In take bal velen ide kim belvay is migdash ru. Yede shabes in rosh choyder v'shach vayz lefon echos. Zav niglo kevoyd Hashem al velen diner neim. Ira 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 ira. Ay, 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 ay,
This event is produced by Tut Alts, a branch of the Mashiach office at Merco Suite 302. Rabbi Moshe Kotlarski, chairman of the Mashiach office. Rabbi Mendy Kotlarski, executive director, Merco's 302. Executive producer, Rabbi Shlemy Naparstik. Producers, Rabbi Mendel Mintz, Rabbi Ellie Newman. Event coordinators, Rechel Korf, Musi Lowenthal. Advisory Board, Rabbi Shace Taub, Rabbi Shmuley Abtsen, Rabbi Mendel Roskin, Rabbi Zalman Volovic, Rabbi Aaron Ginsberg, Rabbi Ephraim Mintz, Rabbi Simon Jacobson, Rabbi Mendy Kotlarski, Chani Greenbaum, Yoli Stern of Stage Productions, Avi Deer Visuals, Branding and Design by Rabbi Schneer Cortez, Shammai Chain and the entire team at 321 Motion. Crown Heights Shmira. Yaakov Langer of Living Lachayim. Base Rivka Schools. Rabbi Shalom Goldstein. Benny Wolf. Printing. Meshulam Rosenblatt. Mendy Smetana. Vod Printing. Thank you to our sponsors Maromim Foundation. Yisrael Foundation. Machon Stam. The Cohen Family Foundation from Canada. To partner in events like these, please visit tutalts.com forward slash partner. The deadly coronavirus officially hitting the U.S. Here Potential banking crisis to demilitarize Ukraine. A terrorist attack in Tel Aviv. The disillusionment, the disappointment with the fake gods, the idols that we once worshipped. One idol after another collapses. First we had communism. Communism destroyed itself. That doesn't happen without Mashiach. That is a genuine Mashiach event. More recently, democracy imploded. Secularism is imploding. These are some pretty big gods, pretty big idols. Science has disappointed. Medicine, politics, money, all these things we once thought were true and real and reliable, gone. They're gone. Nobody fired at them, nobody shot them, nobody destroyed them, nobody even campaigned against them. It simply imploded. All the falsehood came to the surface. We have no more idols. We're ready for God's mission. We're ready to put our trust in Him because it's the only thing that we know now that we can trust. We used to think we knew what life was. Life was traveling. Life was shopping. Life was entertainment, sports, going to work. And then we discovered, you know, you can live without any of that. And in fact, your life actually gets better. During the corona panic, 
the experts were saying marriages are going to fall apart because husband and wife are stuck in the house together. Families are going to tear themselves apart because children are not going to school. They're going to be home too many hours a day. It's going to be bloody. Turned out to be the opposite. Divorce went down by 12%. Children discovered that they actually like being home. That family really is where life happens. And no, you don't have to go to the office. So the world has matured. The world has become more sensitive, more humane, more intolerant of unholiness, more intolerant of war. The Rebbe told us this in a very dramatic statement. The Rebbe said, I have done everything I can to bring Mashiach. Now, the one thing left that I can still do is give it over to you and you bring Mashiach down to earth. It means that the Rebbe in his years of leadership has educated us, has prepared us, that we can take over. He can give it over to us. That's a huge statement. So now it's up to us. What needs to happen? Godliness needs to become natural. It's no longer an exception. It's mainstream. When the Rebbe announced in 1967 that we should have a Tefillin campaign, we had no idea what that meant. Invite people to come to shul to put on Tefillin? The Rebbe said, no, in the street. Put Tefillin on with people in the street. One of the effects of this project is not only that millions of Jews put on Tefillin, and as a result, millions of Jews reconsidered maybe they should keep kosher too. Besides all of that, what happened was we stopped being ashamed. Yes, put on Tefillin, in the street, in the airport, on the airplane. It became mainstream. Yiddishkeit came into its own. So that is really what Mashiach is all about. Not destroy the evil, make godliness mainstream. Bring godliness into the street. Put up a sukkah, let everybody see. Put up a huge menorah, let everybody celebrate. You bring godliness into the life you have, into the place where you live. That's the geula. The geula means Yiddishkeit comes out of Golos. You don't have to do anything about Moshiach. Make godliness normal. That brings Moshiach. The mitzvah of the hour is that we should participate in that happening. And we should worry about others, that they shouldn't miss the opportunity. Add another mitzvah. A little kindness, a little sensitivity, a little holiness, a mitzvah wherever we can, and the world will be amazingly holy. This is obviously a universal project because everyone in the world has to recognize the truth and will recognize the truth. So there are many details, there are many aspects, many dimensions to this global project. And so we have more information, more teachers, more speakers, who will share more information and enlighten us further on how we actually make this happen. And the sooner, the better. Tehillim tonight will be recited by Rabbi Mendy Kotlarski, Executive Director of Merco Suite 302, and Mr. Eliyahu Hakohen Koladenko, Quest Trade President and CEO. For the safety and security of the Yidden in Eretz Yisrael and the world over, and for the imminent coming of Mashiach. Shir Hamalois, Ledovitz, a Machti, Beoim Rimli, Beis Adenoi Nelech. Oim Dois Hoyuragleinu, Beashorai, Hirushaloim. Yerushalayim habnuya ki ir shechubro lo yachtov. Shesham olu shvatim shifteya edus li Yisrael lehoidois l'shem adenoi. Ki shama yashvu kisois l'mishpat kisois l'veiz David. 
Shalu Shalom Yerushalayim, Yishalu Oyavayich. Yehi shalom b'chelech, shalva b'armen o'isoyich. Liman achai v'reya y'adabrono, shalom b'och. Liman v'eis adeno y'eloyheinu, avak shotoy v'loch. Shiramai la se la chanasasi eseini hayoshvi b'shamayim. Hine chayin avadim hayad aruneihem kein ashivcha aliyad gvirta kein eneinu el aranai leheinu ad shichaneinu. Chaneinu aranai chaneinu ki rav sava vanu vuz. Rava Savala Navshenu Halag Hashani Ananim Haboz Lege Yoinim Please welcome Rabbi Moshe Kotlarski, Vice Chairman of Merkos Lianyone Chinuch, Chairman of the Moshiach Office at Merkos Suite 302. The Giula Hasida, the future Giula which we are in the midst of preparing, will be like the Giula of Mitzrayim. How so? We find a very, very interesting Pusik after the whole dialogue between Moshe Rabbeinu and the Abishter and God, who am I, why should I go, who are you, there's a burning bush, all of a sudden we find a Pusik. God convinces Moshe and says, Vayoshev Moshe el Yeser Chesnei. Moshe went back to Yisrael, his father-in-law, and he said, Ashuvana er the Mitzrayim, I will return I will go down to Mitzrayim to see the welfare of my brothers. Are they still alive? And Yisrael basically says, Go The question is asked, Moshe Rabbeinu, what are you saying? You just heard from God himself that they're alive. You're coming to your father and you're saying, Are they alive? I have to see if they're alive. You heard from God they're alive. They're in bondage, they're hurting. Slavery, terrible situation, but they're alive. What is Moshe telling Yisrael? I have to see how Edom Chaim are they still alive? So you could say, joking, I was speaking to somebody, so he says to me, he would go and tell him, I'm going to take the Jews out of Egypt. Yisrael would say, Are you crazy? I was one of his advisors. He's going to chop your block off, he'll make your head shorter. I need a, a husband for my tzipotle. How You know, I mean, I don't need somebody. I need somebody to take care of him. Well, we can't say that about Moshe Rabbeinu. What is Moshe Rabbeinu saying? He's saying, after 210 years of bondage, Ha'idam Chaim, is there still anatem advekim b'ashem alikeichem Do they still believe? Is there something that, is there still belief in, the, in God? And we find Taka that Moshe Rabbeinu stands up in the next parsha and he says, I'm going to take you out. I'm going to bring you to the land of milk and honey. The Jews should have been jumping for joy. I prom God promised Avram Yitzhak and Yaakov, I'm taking you out of Golis. What's the reaction of the Jews? They didn't listen to Moshe. Why? Rashi says, what is Kaitzer Ruach? They were short of breath. So you could imagine 600,000 Jews standing in a field, an 80-year-old Rebbe standing there, 
with a long white beard saying, I'm going to take you out. And they're all going, ha, 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 ha. 600,000 people breathing very heavy. How could anyone hear what Moshe Rabbeinu was saying? But that isn't what it says. It says, the mind was too short to understand spirituality. And this was the first thing that Moshe Rabbeinu had to do to bring into the world was that spirituality. And we find in the next parsha, Pari says, Mi who is going? So our, Moshe says, with our youth and our elders, with our sons and daughters, with our cattle. Shouldn't the first thing be with our sons and daughters? Shouldn't that be the first thing? No, he says, Binarenu Biskeinenu is a lesson to us. Moshe Rabbeinu is saying, when the youth, when our children, our grandchildren are holding the hands of their grandparents, are going in the same way that their forefathers went, Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, then it's Chag Hashem Lanu. Then it is a festival for us. And until after Kriyas Yamsov, that was when there was Vayaminu Bashem of Moshe Avdek. After all of the Makis and everything comes many years later. There's a communist revolution. There's a Bolsheviks. The Friedrich Rebbe has to work day and night, be imprisoned, be thrown down steps so that to instill a Muna, to keep that flame alive. And the Friedrich Rebbe said the hardest thing for him was that he sent somebody on the shlichas. He was taken away the next day, never to be seen again. And a day later, he sent someone to replace him. And comes the Holocaust. Six million of our best and brightest. Auschwitz, Dachau, Bergen, Belsen, Mauthausen. Tzadik Eyalim, the righteous of the generations. Hevel little children who knew no sin, taken to the crematoriums. Today, Ani Mamen, they went singing, I believe, the 13 principles of faith. And comes 1950, the Friedrich Rebbe passes on and goes on high, and the Rebbe takes over the leadership. And the Rebbe says in the first mimer, this is the day Ashri, the seventh generation. This is the day that is going to bring the Shekhinah down Lamata, that is going to end Golas. Set out on a mission then in the first Maimah Yudshva Tavshin Yudalef, that this is going to end Golas. And he went into instill a moon in Klal Yisrael. How many people threw away the Tefillin after the Holocaust? How many people came to America, the gold in the Medina and in the pursuit of the almighty dollar, gold in the streets, went to work on Shabbos and threw away all of the values that they had. And in this atmosphere, the Rebbe takes over the Nasiyas, takes over the leadership, and he says, we're going to end Golas. And what the Rebbe had to do was instill Amunah in Klal Yisrael, instill Amunah and bring back that Amunah to Klal Yisrael. And what does he do? He starts sending out shluchim around the world, starts speaking, makes America shlichas, sends out Bukhram in 1947, already 46, to go out to the world to find that Jew. And comes Chof Ches Nissen, today's day, and the Rebbe says, I was standing right next, right next to the Rebbe that, by that sicha. And when the Rebbe started to speak about this, he started to shake. And he says, I did everything that I can. I'm giving it over to you. But then the Rebbe says, the last line the Rebbe says, that should be one, two, three people that will sit down and are going to find an Eitzah, what to do to bring Mashiach. And he said, it has to be B'yayfun HaMeskabal. Be acceptable. Eidus the toyo bekelim the tikkun. Can't be wa 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 wa. It has to be something practical. And he gave everyone a license. You find a way in which to do it. And a few years ago, it dawned on me: What is the Rebbe giving us? He says he did everything. What is the Rebbe giving to Klal Yisrael? The one thing that he couldn't do. 
The Shabbos afterwards, the Rebbe had a spoke, and he spoke about learning Pirkei Avis, which throughout the whole period of time, there was this same system. What is Pirkei Avis? Live a life, live a life of Gola. Hachanatzmi, prepare yourself. The next week he spoke about learning the Yonam of Giyola and Mashiach. Prepare the world for Mashiach. And this went through everything that the Rebbe said had either a bent on preparing yourself or preparing the world. But what can we do that the Rebbe did not do? He could have done it, but he gave it over to us. And that is to reach each and every Jew in the world that they should do a mitzvah, it should be a der shekulei zakai. It should be a generation that is fully righteous. There shouldn't be one Jew in the world that isn't doing a mitzvah. There is nobody that doesn't have somebody that he works with, one person, five people, ten people, that you could go over in the morning and say with him, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Alekeinu, Hashem Echad, which is a mitzvah of Achtos Hashem, Tvila, you translate it, it becomes Limitatayra, put a penny into the pushka, it's Avos Yisrael, it's Tzedakah. There isn't one person in the world. So we have to campaign one mitzvah at a time. But if you take 10 people and you do these five mitzvahs with them, you have 50 mitzvahs. 50 mitzvahs, it's 1,000 mitzvahs a month, 12,000 12, mitzvahs a year. Within a year, if you have 5,000, 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 people doing it, there shouldn't be one Jew that shouldn't be doing a mitzvah. We have to end Golas. And the only way to do it is by reaching each and every Jew in the world. And this is what the Rebbe gave us. He says, I need foot soldiers. Not only Shluchim, every Jew. Each and every one of you. Go out into the world, tell them Mashiach is ready to come. We just have to do the final things that are also maybe also done. But it is up to us to bring home the Giyula. There will be no Dairashmini. There, will be, there won't be a next gen. The Dairashvi, which is us, will bring the Giyula. The question is us waking up, waking up ourselves, waking up our friends. And it shouldn't become something that is stale, something that the Rebbe spoke about 30 years ago. The Rebbe, and with this all can said, that the Bardichev said he won't go into Ganeidin until Mashiach comes. So what did they do? He was standing by the gate. They said, Kedusha, he jumped three times and he found himself in Gan Eden. The Rebbe said, what is the Yetzir? I'm going to make a neder al das rabim. I will make a vow that I'm not going into Gan Eden until Mashiach comes. Now you have to understand, I don't know what's going on up there, where the Rebbe is, but wherever he is, all the Rabbeim are, I'm sure all the Tzadik Eilam from all the generations are there. Give the Rebbe a present, 120 million mitzvahs, 240 million mitzvahs, 360 million mitzvahs. You could tell the Abisha, look, it's 30 years almost since Kimmel Thomas. Look, look what Klal Yisrael is doing. So many mitzvahs. It is up to each and every one of us to do this. And you should know that we, if we will do it and will become a Dershe Kulei Zakai, we definitely will be Zerche to get and bring down Mashiach. But remember, it's something to be done today, not tomorrow. It can't wait. All of the things that are happening in the world show that it's a last throw. The Samach Mem is trying his best that Mashiach should not come. Pay a price for it. But... The end result is we will win. Mashiach will come. As long as Israel existed, the Arab states were always at a state of war. In the mid-60s, President Nasser, who was like the preeminent Arab leader of the time, was already making threats. And they, were, they kept calling for the extinction of Israel. They closed the ports, they closed the Suez Canal. 1967, I was nine years old. My father was a journalist. 
I saw it through those eyes. I remember the radio was on all the time. I just remember a climate of a lot of uh, crisis. So I remember as a kid, there was a parade in 1967, like Bomber Parade, all the children were outside, and the Rebbe speaking, there are videos of it, very powerful. He says that God protects us. There'll be peace in the land. We have to stand strong. There shouldn't be any fears and any concerns. So Israel decided to take a preemptive strike before they attacked them. Israel attacked the Arab countries on all fronts and miraculously won the war in six days. Israel tripled after the Six Day War size, won in a completely miraculous way. The Six Day War represented not just that we survived World War II, that the country where the Jews have now established a homeland is going to succeed. So I think it was the first epiphany that not just we got out of the Holocaust, that we are going to be a very strong country. It gave that confidence that from here on, we are not going to be victims anymore. And that affected the whole consciousness of Jews, Jews everywhere. And indeed, we saw that the Rebbe was correct. As much as some were doomsday scenarios, it ended up being miraculous, almost no casualties. And that was what the headline everybody knows. But something deeper was going on. You know, the Rebbe as a true leader looked at the big picture. I saw the events as being more than just, okay, a war, we've won miraculously, let's move on. He saw it as a uh, spiritual wake-up call. He called it exactly that. And he really called on all of us to do whatever we can to capitalize on it. People everywhere were seeking. People everywhere were interested. Give them what they're looking for. Teach them the beauty of Judaism, of Torah, of mitzvahs. Right then, the Rebbe started the tefillin campaign even before Six Day War. Quoting a verse, your enemies will see tefillin on you, they'll be afraid. So he said, this is a perfect time. Make sure every soldier puts on tefillin. So in Israel began a massive campaign to have soldiers putting on tefillin. And then slowly, very much corresponding to events in Israel, the Rebbe began different programs and campaigns, essentially using this as a catalyst, because it's not just about awakening, and now what? Judaism comes down to actions, comes down to deeds. So it was clearly he was turning this into a global movement. Talk about mitzvah tanks. It's a phenomenon you didn't see in the time of the Alter Rebbe, you didn't see in the time of the Friedrich Rebbe, the previous Rebbe. But in our time, where you could do this, you can go to the city of Manhattan or other cities and blare music and attract people and get them off the street and put on the film. It's a method. And the Rebbe used a contemporary method to reach people that would never have been reached. You'd never be able to get to them in their office. Or they go to a lunch break, you can get them. Every specific campaign, every specific detail, every program was not independent. It was all part of the big picture, all part of Gaula picture. And then of course, we all know the 28th Nissan talk that we're honoring, where the Rebbe said, I did everything I can. What was he saying? All these camp campaigns, Six Day War, all the way back to 1951, 50. It was all I laid it out. out. Now, do what you have to do. Do everything you can do 
So for the Rebbe, it wasn't just, okay, we're the seventh generation, now let's sit around, we'll be good Jews, and we'll wait around, Mashiach is going to come. No, your actions are going to expedite it and going to reveal it. We are an integral part of the process, meaning the people that are implementing it. And that's why quoting the Rambam that the Rebbe would quote so often, a person has to see the world as equally balanced. One good deed, one good word, one good thought tips the scales. It's only one deed, because it's not just one deed, it's coming after thousands. But that tips the scale, so it's you and your action. What are you going to do? When I remember hearing the talk of, of 28th of Nissan, I went away with one thing. The Rebbe saying, what are you going to do now? Don't look at me, don't look at your father don't, and mother, don't look at God. What are you going to do? We recognize the responsibility and the gift that your one act can change the world. It could be that your act is the one that will tip the scales for all of history and bring that redemption. And every time we behave, we have to think in those terms, that this could be that act, this could be that moment. Two thousand five hundred years ago, the prophet Yeshaya talks about what will happen in the end of times. The gathering of all the Jews the world over, the Atem, to look to Echad Echad Beis Yisrael. Every individual will be lovingly gathered by Hashem, by hand by hand, each individual, and brought to the Geula Shlema in Eretz Hakodesh. This week. Hundreds of thousands of Yidin throughout the entire world will be concluding the 42nd cycle of learning the Rambam, the 14th cycle of studying the Rambam one chapter a day. In his final halacha, the Rambam concludes his entire Sefer Mishnah Torah, Uba Yazman, what will happen in the end of times? And he talks about the ingathering of the exiles that Mashiach Yekabetz Mitche Yisrael. He will gather all the Yidin today. This is no longer something we yearn for in the future. It's not something we're looking forward to. It's here and now. The Giula, the gathering of the exile, is part of our mandate today. Today it's about each and every one of us seeing ourselves as bringing each and every Yid to their Geula Pratis. One Yid, one Mitzvah. We've brought Geula to their inner essence to their inner being, preparing them and preparing the world for the ultimate in gathering of the exiles when Hashem will take every Jew lovingly, each one by the hand and bring them to the Geula Shlema. But really, can we understand how one interaction can be so meaningful, so powerful? Can one mitzvah have that great of an impact preparing the entire world for Geula? And I remember that day I was driving down Chalmers Street, just two blocks from here. And I was at the corner of Chalmers and Second. And there I see a nice Jewish boy just moved into campus. The first week of school where they have nothing to do other than parties. And there I see a boy who I heard from friends might be coming to campus, making his way into the fraternity. We roll down my window. And the car pulls up and this guy pulls down the window with the fedora, with the beard. <laughs> and with a warm smile. Like, Sam, welcome to campus. It's so great to see you. That was not something I was expecting to come rolling up out of nowhere on my way, you know, just to continue, continue the party and keeping the party going. We invited him to Shabbos. He wasn't sure if he was gonna come. He told me later on, ha, here he came to campus to run away from it all. His first day, he bumps into the rabbi, but he came by. You seem cool, you seem trustworthy. Uh, I definitely am open and interested in coming by and experiencing Shabbos with you and seeing what you're all about. So boy, I might have gone to Jewish schools. Might have gone to Jewish high school. Might have gone to Yeshiva in Israel. 
But he told me that Friday night he came by and he stayed after dinner to Fabrink. I mean, Fabrink till three o'clock in the morning. I didn't leave his house that Friday night. I slept on the couch. We had such a good time. And uh, I stayed up all night with him, picking his brain and singing with him. And the energy was great. My impression of Judaism was never, let's get rowdy, let's have fun. It was always like, this is boring, let's go home. <laughs> so <laughs> this was something new to me, something refreshing to me. I really enjoyed it. I fell asleep on the couch, woke up for davening. And with all his history, that was the first Shabbos he kept in his life. Not in Eretz Yisrael, not in his Jewish high school, but in the place that he went to run away from it all. And why? Because someone reached out to him. Echad, one student, one invitation, one experience. And he's been keeping Shabbos since. When I moved to New York, I got involved with Rev. Dov Yona Korn at Chabad House Bowery, who was uh, an amazing personality and someone I just naturally connected to. He had introduced me to a gentleman that was running an organization. His name was Yoni Greenwald. And he was running this building in the East Village called the Brownstone. There was a very cool Jewish center, a lot of events for like birthright type students. After I had graduated and gotten married, Yoni had reached out to me and asked me if I would take over for him and live in that building and run that center and run his community. It was not on my radar. I'm not a rabbi. I'm, I never thought of myself as necessarily a Jewish leader. You never know what one experience is gonna do to you. I'm trying to escape my religious practice by going to University of Illinois, enter stage right, the rabbi pulls up and invites me for Shabbos. And next thing you know, I'm running this Jewish center in the East Village of Manhattan with thousands of young Jews rolling through our door and I'm their connecting point. I was living in the West Village at the time and a gentleman that I uh, was working with invited me to the Brownstone. And I remember I showed up to the Brownstone. It was this uh, beautiful four-story building in a great location. And we went up to the second floor, which is the Brownstones, sort of like uh, one of their event areas. And there was one extremely long Shabbat table, had about 75 people there call it. So at that Shabbat meal is, the, is when I met Sam. And Sam has this amazing presence. He has this amazing first impression. He's very gracious, he's very positive. Thanked me for hosting him at the Brownstone. I thanked him for being there and started showing up at more of our events. And I started to get to know him. I realized that Isaac just kept coming back. He kept looking for more. I've had an opportunity to now be part of a Jewish organization's board where we're inviting more Jews to come and get more involved. I've grown in my Judaism many times because of him. He's hosted me personally in his home. I've gone to synagogue with him. Uh, he was actually one of the guys that, taught, that told me about a Jewish advocacy class that was hosted on the second floor of his organization, the Brownstone. And I attended that class, and I could confidently say that I would not be living in Israel now if it wasn't for what I learned in that class. So this is just another example of second, third, fourth degree effects of, of one mitzvah or one human just having an impact on someone, just like the way Sam had an impact on me. Isaac got involved through Sam's work. Sam got involved through that interaction that we had on the street corner. Now Isaac's involved in trying to get others involved. It doesn't end. Something that starts in Champaign, Illinois, of Reb David, uh, I guess, uh, bringing me out of the frat house and into the Chabad house, it w was kind of something that was meant to happen so that I could run the Brownstone and connect with Isaac. That one Shabbos meal was something that completely changed the whole direction of my life. That impacted me to then impact other Jews and try and get them to come to the Brownstone. Then they brought their friends. It's a, it's a total trickle effect. Every mitzvah of every size by every and any Jew is preparing the world for Mashiach. The value of every single yid. Us doing our mitzvah, our one little contribution, however small it might be, it's not small. It's huge. You could do this too. You are Sam. You are Isaac. You are David. It's your script. It's just one Shabbos. Just one person. One mitzvah. One moment. And you could change the world and bring Mashiach. Please welcome Mr. Charlie Harari. You stand here today and you hear all the stories of the Rebbe, 
all the opportunities, all the work that we've been done. And you kind of ask yourself, what are we missing? Why isn't it here yet? How much longer? It feels like it should have come. It feels like there's something blocking. Mashiach, Geula, what we're searching for, what we want. What is it that's getting in our way of accomplishing this incredible goal of bringing Geula? So I want to share with you a story. I began my life as a corporate lawyer. And the way it works in the big firms is that you start off as an intern. And in your year of interning, you rotate different departments and you get to see different parts of the firm. Ultimately, they're checking you out, you're checking out which departments you are, so you know what to choose when you come back as a full-time lawyer. So it was around 2002. This was the time, if you remember, of the dot-com craze. People were starting dot-com companies. And this was just the beginning where it was starting to come to that end. And I was rotating through a group called M&A. Mergers and Acquisitions. And I, because the Abishta runs the world and he's good to me, I was given the following around. Yeah, what do you do when you're an intern? You get coffee, you follow somebody around, and you pretend like you know something. And I was given the guy who was one of the foremost mergers and acquisitions lawyers in New York. He was considered to be one of the greatest negotiators in the city. And my luck, or my Sata the Shemaya, as I was given to his department, they were in the middle of this incredible negotiation. It made the papers, I can't talk about it, but it made the papers. What was happening was the entrepreneurs started a technology, became a company, and we were representing the investors. And the investors wanted the technology. They knew it was valuable. The company not so much, but the technology was. And the entrepreneurs wanted the technology, and they were fighting over who would own the technology. So the day comes, and we're prepping in the office. And he's, we're talking, all of us, and he's saying, at the end of the day, it's theirs. And if, we, if they push hard enough, we have to give in. And the client's saying, you're right, okay. He goes, but we're going to try our hardest to get it for you. And I'm thinking to myself, what are you going to possibly do? It's, a, it's one issue. They're going to go for it. They're going to get the technology. Okay, we walk into this beautiful conference room on the 50th floor of this gorgeous building, and he sits down, and they sit down. Can you imagine a big room across from each other? And he starts. And he starts talking about the most random things. The company, vacation days, who's in charge of the website. And they look at him like, what are you, crazy? What are you talking about? And he's aggressive. I want you to have this, and I want to get the website, and I'm in charge of marketing, and who's in charge of vacation? And I'm thinking to myself, what is he talking about? This isn't about the website. This isn't about vacation days. And he's aggressive. And they, all of a sudden, after a while, start engaging him and going, what are you talking about? Why should you get the vacation days? Why should you get the marketing? And all of a sudden, the negotiation becomes all about these other things. And then he switches. And he says, oh, you know what? You're right. You should be in charge of marketing. Yeah, uh, you know what? I think you guys should be in charge of setting the policy for uh, PTO time off. And one by one, he starts giving up all these really relevant but insignificant details. And finally, you get to the end of an hour and a half negotiation, and everybody's exhausted. And they say, what about the technology? And he goes, I, uh, you're not getting the technology. And they go, OK. <laughs> and I'm going, no, 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 don't say OK. <laughs> I, I can't say anything. They'd fire me. I go, no, no, it's yours. Just ask for it. And they're so tired. And he gave up so many little things that they didn't even know how to fight anymore. And from the exhaustion, they just stopped fighting and they gave in. They figured it would all work itself out. And they walk away. And I came back to the office and I'm like, I cannot believe what I just saw. It was one of the most masterful moments, in, I thought, in my whole career. And I didn't even do anything. It was unbelievable and sad. What are we waiting for? What do we block? What's our block? Listen to the words of the Nesiva Shalom. And he tells us something that is so powerful that I believe is what is holding us back from Geula. He says, From the beginning of time, we were ready for Chavle Mashiach, Hagadolom Kodim Bias Mashiach. We knew there'd be Chavle Mashiach. We knew it would be painful. We were preparing ourselves for the pain we have to go through before we get to Mashiach. And we have to believe he's coming. 
after we've already gone through Chevle Mashiach. We are now, the Siva Shalom says, we've already gone through Chavle Mashiach. We, we, we just survived. We went through the Holocaust and pogroms and crusades. We're ready for it now. Rock is one thing that's missing. We've already earned Mashiach. There's one thing left. We have to need it. We have to want it. It has to be what we're asking for. We, it's our technology. <speaking> in order to get them to Yeshua, we need to have that amuna. And then watch what happens. Like a good lawyer. You know what he does? He tries to confuse us. He tries to, to, to make us not understand. Today, why? What is going on here? From the beginning of time, we are the people that brought Hashem to this world. Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. This is our legacy. We're the ones. My Yafu Pa'amayach Na'alayach Bas Nadiv. Shira Shirim says, you know what is so amazing? The people coming to see the Shekhinah from the Beis HaMikdash, the Bas Nadiv, the, the children of Avraham. We wanted our technology. We demanded our technology. We demanded Geula. And then you know what happened? The Babylonians and the Persians and the Crusades and the Cossacks, they beat us and beat us, not for Geula, for life, the small things, for health and home and family, vacation days. Marketing, they kept on pushing us and pushing us and pushing us. And Gullahs took us, the Holocaust, all through Europe, Gullahs took us piece by piece by piece and broke us down until what we really want is not Gullah. What we really want is a better Gullahs. We want a nicer Gullahs. We want them to not kill us. Leave us alone. Let us make a few dollars. Let the house be safe. I don't want to hear about our Israel fighting. I don't want to hear about somebody getting shot up. Just let the kids get married and let everyone be healthy. It's nice, this Torah here, it works. After a life of the greatest lawyer of all time, fighting us, they, they, he gave in. He goes, here you go. Hey, okay, here's some, here's some money, you good? Here's some Torah, you okay? Got the internet for you, you can learn whatever you want online. Here's an airplane, you can fly to Eretz Yisrael. You okay now? You good? And we're so tired of Gullus that we say, you know what? I, I'm not even asking for the technology. Geula, I don't know. Just give me a decent gullus. I'll be okay. Kodesh Baruch Hu is saying, you're almost there. But you're not going to bring geula if you want it. You got to need it. You have to look at everything and say, I'm not happy. I'm not happy with anything that you give me except for you. If you don't come to this world, if you don't reveal yourself, I'm not going to be satisfied with all the money and all the safety and all the airplanes. The Kodesh Baruch who's waiting for us to not want it, to need it, to demand it, to see the world through the prism of only that will make me happy because it is ours. I want to share with you one idea. How do you do that? How do you build the fire? How do you turn on the fire? Davin. You know, there's a, a good litmus test to what you need. What you want, you hope you get. What you need, you daven for. You ever notice that? When I was a kid, I daven for the Yankees. They needed it. I needed it. T together, we needed it. When they played the Boston Red Sox, oh, why could I daven? And then I got older, and I stopped davening for the Yankees. You see people all the time. They get older. They need shaduchim. They daven for it all of a sudden. Right? They have kids. All of a sudden, they start davening for health for their children. Everything is fine. One day, God forbid, they have a health scare. You know what happens the next day? They daven for health. What happened to two days ago? They didn't need it two days ago. All of a sudden, they needed it. 
And when you need health, you dive in for health. You want to know how to turn up the fire of need? We start to daven for Geula. You see Eretz Yisrael ripping itself apart. You stop, and with all your might, you tell the Kodesh Baruch Hu in your words, Hashem, please just bring Geula. Save the Jews in Eretz Yisrael. You see a Jew walking down the street that's not keeping kosher, that's not putting on tefillin. Before you walk up to him, you close your eyes and say, bring Geula. There shouldn't be a Jew that doesn't look up and say, Hashem, Hashem, who will him. When we wake up in the morning, when we go to bed at night, when we have children we have to teach, when we walk around the streets, when we close our eyes in Shema Koleinu, when we close our eyes at Uvnei Yushalayim, when we close our eyes, we have to daven. Bring Geula. Help that person. Help Klal Yisrael with Geula eyes. And the more we daven for something, the more the Ratzon builds inside us. And when that rut zone is so strong that we are not leaving the negotiation table without our technology, then the lawyer across the table says, I got nothing to say. And the Kurdish Baruch looks and says, I've been waiting for my kids to want me as much as I want them. You fulfilled Tzipis of Yeshua. We should be zoichet to see a day where a generation of Jew turns to Hashem and says, I am not satisfied with anything but you. And with that, we'll be so good to see Mashiach Sidkenu come in our days in Hera Amenu. Amen. Yifrach meyom bov tzadik Verof shalom av liyoreya Yifrach meyom bov tzadik first experience with Chabad was in the Virgin Islands of all places. It was Hanukkah time and I was on a cruise with my family and we had gotten off the cruise and at the front of the cruise ship were these young men and they were handing out Hanukkah menorahs and my father had taken one from the boys and he went to go reach inside of his pocket to go pay for it. And they said, no, 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 we don't want money from you. We want a commitment. What's the commitment? You must promise to light the menorah with your children every night till the end of Hanukkah. 
my father agreed, he took the menorah, and we went on our excursion, and then we came back onto the cruise ship that night, and we went for dinner. As always in the cruise ships, the way that it works is, you have these gigantic atriums where two or 3,000 people sit on different levels. And we were sitting right in the middle, dead center of the atrium. The daughter says, Dad, we got a Monera today from the students in St. Thomas. Let's light it. So she ran to the room, she brought it to the table, and we put it in the middle of our section, and we lit it. We didn't even ask for permission. I'm sure we weren't even allowed to. I remember that within a few minutes, the table next to us, all of a sudden, they had their menorah and they lit theirs too. Within a half hour, over 70 tables took out the menorahs they received that day from Chabad and lit them. And then another one, and another one, and another one, another one, another one, another one, until the entire atrium was lit up with these Hanukkah menorahs. The entire cafeteria was lit with the holiness and the beauty of Hanukkah. In the deepest, darkest part of the night, there was these menorahs that were lit. Sailing away from the harbor in the middle of the Caribbean Sea, you had an entire ship that was filled with the Kedusha, with the Halakite, with the light of the Menera, with the light of the Geula. These all came from these Bachrim. They never even knew what effect they had because they didn't get to experience the fruits of their labor. Five years later, on Hanukkah, I get a call from a younger man in Montreal, Avram Simmons, and he tells me, Usher, you'll never believe it. As I started to become more observant, started keeping kosher, putting on tefillin, keeping Shabbos, I decided that I wanted to go to Mayanot, which is a yeshiva for Balchubas in Jerusalem. The night before I left, I invited a bunch of people that were part of my journey in becoming more observant. I invited them to my house for, for bring-in. And one of those people, his name was Abram Simmons. For the last six months, I've been learning with a Bacher who's heading to Yeshiv in Mayanot. And Shabbos, he made a Fabrengen in his house. During the Fabrengen, he stands up and he says, I want to share with everybody my journey to Yiddishkeit. I decided at the Fabrengen to tell over that story from that menorah from the Virgin Islands. Abraham's face, as I was telling the story, turned white. He said, Beryl, I was that Bacher that gave you and your father that menorah. I was on Shlichus on that island in that year, and both of our minds were absolutely blown how the whole thing came full circle. Henya used to always tell me, and she always used to say, and we lived by this motto. The Rebbe taught us all not just to build an institution, a big center, or only to care about our Balabatim, but rather to build Klal Yisrael, a lummi, each of us in our shtetlach, one by one, and thereby the entire Jewish world. We're here to build the Jewish world. We're here to bring Mashiach. And to see to it that the atem to look to le'echad echad beis Yisrael, that every single individual Jew, no matter where they are, no matter what stage they're holding in life, to make sure that they are brought closer to Yiddishkeit, that is what will bring Mashiach. It's the very small act, the one mitzvah at a time, the one Jew at a time, the one effort at a time. You never know who you're about to touch. You never know what that will change in their lives. So my message to all the great people that are doing this, and my message to the Fettermans and everybody around the world is that keep on doing the great work that you do because without you, I wouldn't be sitting here today to tell the story. Our one mitzvah, our one reaching out to another Yid has the potential to be machriya sakaf. You have the kayach, the infinite kayach of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to be able to bring Moshiach the Pail Mamash. So each and every one of us can and must be a Rib David, a Sam, an Isaac, a Rib Usher or a Beryl. The Atem to look to Echad Echad is applicable, relevant, and a call to action. 
to every man, woman, and child today. For the rabbi, oh, that fellow in my community, why bother? He never shows up. He never put on tefillin. Who will be his redeemer if not I? I have to see he is that one echad in my community. He is my mission to ignite his soul and bring Geula Pratis to him. For the parents, echad echad, each and every one of our children will be empowered to recognize they matter. Every one of their mitzvahs is of global importance and so is their influence on their friends and neighbors. The highlight of our week will be Friday night at the Shabbos table where every member of the family, Tati, Mami, Chaim, and Suri are all sharing their wonderful experiences. How did I advance myself and the world around me, one mitzvah, one individual, to bring Mashiach sooner? Every day we wake up in the morning, our Ani is infused with the perspective, today is the day. Mashiach will be here and I will greet him. Can we imagine? what that day will look like, our meaningful relationships, our davening, our mitzvahs, our passion, and our recognition that every interaction is of global importance. For the businessman, I will bring my tefillin to my office. I will have a pushkin, a central place in my office, so I can have an opportunity to share mitzvahs with everyone, all my customers, vendors, and clients. So, is it, so it is also applicable to those of us who have any power of influence, today, this week, we will all beginning, be beginning a new cycle in the Rambam. It's an opportunity for every man, woman, and child to join a daily schedule of learning, thereby having the opportunity to complete the entire Torah, Kol HaTorah Kula. It's important for all of us to join the initiative and see how many people can I share this initiative? Men, women, and children have their own cycle of learning in which they can complete the entire Torah. And finally, we have an opportunity, a milestone in our life, a simcha, an opportunity, a birthday. Let's take the opportunity in addition to preparing a wonderful simcha to see that this will also empower people with more and more mitzvahs. Take on a mitzvah chain campaign. Join onemitzvah.com in which you will have the opportunity to create an initiative where many people will so much want to join your simcha by taking on another mitzvah. Together, each and every one of us will recognize Echad Echad is our mandate. We will do it as an individual. We will do it collectively. We will transform the world and bring about the ultimate va'atim to look to Echad Echad. Hashem will take every yid, bring them to the Geula Shlema, take it from Yad. If you are listening to this right now, I want you to know, you don't have to be a shuliach. You don't have to be a rav or a rashi shiva or a teacher. You have to be you, the organic you. Share one kind word with someone and you could change their life. Stretch out your hand, the helping hand, to someone in need. You put on tefillin, encourage someone else to do so. You start a class, you learn something, you learn with someone else. We bring Mashiach closer by doing that one mitzvah. How can I bring a mitzvah to another person? Without an agenda. Just bring them a mitzvah. Ba'at them to look to echad echad. If you love making Kiddush, share it with somebody. Teach them how to make Kiddush. The world right now needs every person in their own capacity to go out and give of themselves. Do something for another person. Do something for someone other than yourself. You have absolutely no idea how much of an impact and how important your one small mitzvah could do to the world. Any Jew, every Jew of every ethnicity, every background, every observance level. One Jew doing one mitzvah, one person at a time. That one flame that we light, we never know how far and how impactful and how deep it can penetrate into another person's neshama. Just one mitzvah. Share a mitzvah, just one mitzvah, Bring Mashiach closer. We are going to bring Mashiach together, one person at a time.
Ivre Tzadikim Kayom and Load. The words of the righteous are eternal and timeless. We're going to watch a short excerpt of the Rebbe's words, An Chav Chetz Nisan Aleph, 1991. And we should have in mind that this is not a recording of something that was said decades prior to today, but something that exists eternally and in the present moment. And if we can try to focus and take these words to heart, having the intention that the Rebbe is speaking to us right now at this moment with this message today. So I, I was told this is the the Fabrengen. So I will do away with the typical uh, formalities, in spite of the fact that I'm seated with Choshev Rabbanim, and we'll just uh, sit like Chassidim at a Fabrengen, and I'll just share informal words. I don't think anyone can watch that video and not be deeply moved by the Rebbe's tone, the Rebbe's emotion. It's, it's intense to watch, and indeed, people who were there, very few people were there, it was not such a big crowd at the time, but those who were there were taken aback. You might even say many were disturbed. What does the Rebbe mean? What, is, what are the implications of the Rebbe saying that he's done everything he can Personally, I can tell you that I was only very, uh, not only I wasn't there, I mean, I, I'm from Chicago, I, I didn't grow up in Crown Heights, and I was only very tangentially aware of what was going on. Um, it wasn't, you know, Charlie mentioned earlier, I love Charlie, by the way, he mentioned davening for the Yankees. Yeah, Charlie's still here? Okay. So... When he said he da used to daven for the Yankees, I thought to myself, in the spring of 1991, when this sicha, when the Rebbe spoke these words, I can tell you, and I'm not proud of this, but it's just a reality, 
it was more on my radar that the, the Bulls were headed toward the playoffs in their first championship of their three-peat. That was more on my radar than the fact that the Rebbe said what he said on Chav Ches Nissen, Toshinon Aleph. And for whatever it's worth, I, I will tell you that today, the fact that Mashiach is more important to me in my life than Michael Jordan, Lahavdil, is probably one of the miracles of the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Just personally, you're looking at one. Um, and with each passing year, the message of that day becomes more resonant and more urgent and more meaningful to me. I'm just speaking, I said, we're just speaking personally here. This is not a speech. I don't have notes. The paper here is actually, it's a printout of the, of the, of the Fabrengen. This is actually the, the Mugad de Kasicha, the edited version. It's five pages of the, the Sicha that the Rebbe spoke. And um, as the time goes by, the words become more and more relevant to me. So what was the Rebbe saying? You, you, you see this video, you see the Rebbe is clearly impassioned about what he's saying. It's clearly a very serious thing that Rebbe is saying. But I think there's a lot of misunderstanding. And, and I want to clear it up or attempt to clear it up. Um, and this is just one person's opinion, for whatever it's worth. I'm not the arbiter, the official interpreter of Chabad or what the Rebbe meant. This, I'm just telling you what I understand. When you watch the video, it seems like, well, it's clear that Rebbe is saying that he attempted to do something. He had a goal. He didn't accomplish that goal. In fact, the Rebbe says very harsh words I don't even want to repeat about how he feels about his level of accomplishment. Basically says, I, I didn't accomplish anything. Um, but the question is, what was that goal? And, and, I, and I think a lot of times people think that Rebbe said, I tried to bring Mashiach, I couldn't bring Mashiach, now you do it. And that's not exactly what the Rebbe said. And in the Mugadik Asicha, meaning the edited talk, that the Rebbe himself personally edited meticulously, it, it, the words become more clear, what the Rebbe actually said. Lest you think that this was a moment of frustration and, and the Rebbe just said something in the heat of the moment, not that the Rebbe would speak that way, but even if you thought that, <sighs> the Rebbe had time afterwards to sit down and to review the transcript and to edit it meticulously and to make it say exactly what the Rebbe wanted to say before, before it went to print. And if you look at the printed words, the Rebbe says the goal that he was trying to accomplish that he hasn't yet accomplished was to get each and every one of us to care about Mashiach as much as he cares about Mashiach. That's the goal that Rebbe says. I tried to get you guys to care about Mashiach. You say Ad Mosai. Yeah, you say Ad Mosai. Because you were told to say Ad Mosai. But you don't really fully, completely mean it. I tried to get you to mean it. But you don't yet mean it. So therefore, what's the only thing left to do? I'm giving you the job. When you understand that, now the whole thing makes sense. Because if you thought that I was saying, I tried, to bring, I tried to bring Mashiach, I couldn't do it, okay, you do it. it, it, it it's not even logical. If the Rebbe couldn't do it, then <laughs> how could we do it? But that's not what the Rebbe said. The Rebbe said, I tried to get you to care. Okay, you still don't care. So you know what I'll do? Very simple. I'll make it your job. Now you'll care. Or eventually you'll grow into it. You'll come to care because no one else is going to alleviate you of this responsibility. The buck stops here. You are the one that has to care. Now that's a revolutionary concept. All throughout history, if you learn and you daven and, and you do mitzvahs, you give tzedakah, you give your children a Jewish education, you're a good Jew and nobody could expect anything more from you. What else could you expect from a, from a Jew? That's it. And especially doing all of this in Golis, with the hardships that we have in this world, and, and, and having a body, and a Yetzirah, and all the distractions, temptations, 
You're a good Jew. Who could ask you to do anything more than just live a good Jewish life, lead a nice Jewish family, and you're golden. You're great. That's it. World perfection? <laughs> a world of peace, prosperity? <laughs> who thinks about that? Who worries about that? that that's a global issue. Let the, big, let the big head honchos worry about the big issues. Ah, let, let me just focus on, I'll stay in my lane. Let me focus on me, focus on my family, focus on my life. Maybe if I have time, I'll, I'll look at my community, see where I can help. But no, I, it, it's not my job to save the world. Let the Lubavitcher Rebbe save the world. I can't save the world. So comes the Rebbe and says, no. It's your job to save the world. You, you. You are the leader of world jewelry. And if you really want to know, this didn't happen all at once. It didn't happen one day on Chav Chesnes and Tav Shinon Aleph. It started from day one of the Rebbe's leadership. When the Rebbe introduced the concept that the goal of this generation was to bring Mashiach, the Rebbe didn't just say what the goal was, the Rebbe said how it had to be done, and it specifically had to be done through the work of every individual. It's up to us. Don't look at somebody else and think it's his job to perfect the universe. It's your job. You know how the Rebbe explained that. Not just the world was created for my sake. Ha'elam, the world, means also ha'elam, the concealment. That the tzimtzum arishayin, the divine concealment, was created because of me. It's my job, it's my personal mission and nobody else's to remove the concealment that hides the creation, that hides the creator from the creation. That, 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 that doesn't allow us to see godliness in an open and a, re, and a revealed way. My job, no one else's job. That's why it makes sense, by the way, when the Rebbe continues and says, what's the proof that I didn't get you guys to really care? Is that we're still in Gaulis, and not just Gaulis in the physical sense. The Rebbe says, Oid Iker, even more so, primarily, the Gaulis Pnimi Binyane Aveda Sashem. The internal Gaulis. What is the internal Gaulis? The internal Gaulis means that other things are still more important to me than being leader of world Jewry. Other things are still getting more of my headspace and heart space than saving the planet. That's the gullus panimi, that I haven't stepped up and taken responsibility yet to heal the entire world. Now, for any of us to come up with that on our own would be the height of arrogance. And, and, and perhaps insanity. But <laughs> we didn't come up with this. In fact, we didn't want it. The Rebbe put it on us and identified us as having this mission and said, you've got to be the man or the woman. You step up. You know, after the Rebbe said these words, then the Rebbe said, there's another piece where the Rebbe spoke again. And the Rebbe said, and in order to hurry along what I spoke about, I'm going to do my part and I'm going to give a dollar to each individual to make them a shliach mitzvah. I think a lot of people overlook the importance of that, that follow-up. First of all, clearly the Rebbe didn't just retire because right after it, the Rebbe says, now I'm going to go give dollars. So the Rebbe's still working, clearly. Okay. But what, what is the Rebbe still working? What is the Rebbe still doing? I'm going to give dollars. Okay, dollars for what? A souvenir? No, the Rebbe said, shliach mitzvah, shliach mitzvah. The Rebbe gave dollars to deputize people. Here's the dollar, tag, you're it. Now it's your shlichus. And shliach shall adam kamaisai. The Rebbe used to say that all the time. And the Rebbe would add the Alta Rebbe's words. Mamash. When you become deputized by someone, you become literally that person. The Rebbe even said that the gematri of shliach plus 10, which is the esekeiches and nefesh, the soul powers, our intellect, our emotions, is the gematria of Mashiach. So shliach 
each individual emissary, and every Jew is an emissary of Hashem, plus their 10 soul powers when they're completely engaged intellectually and emotionally, they are Mashiach. Or like the Rebbe brought the, the Mo'er the Chernobyl Rebbe used to say, that the Yechida Shebenefesh, the core essence of every Jew, is the Nitzot Shel Mashiach, is the spark of Mashiach that's in every in individual one of us. So this was the Rebbe's project. The Rebbe's project was not to bring Mashiach, but to get us to take up the task, the responsibility, the mission, the calling, that we individually, each one of us, have to be the one to bring Mashiach. A year later, after these words, Sunday, Chof, Vav, Adar, the 26th day of the month of Adar. It was a Sunday that I gave dollars, Sunday dollars. There was a Jew from Toronto who came to get a dollar from the Rebbe, and he, uh, his name was Gabriel Aram, originally from Hungary, a Holocaust survivor, and a very uh, philanthropic individual, and he was involved in publishing. He had a magazine called Lifestyles Magazine, not a Jewish magazine, not at all a Jewish magazine, it's an, an executive magazine for, you know, Stasi people. And Surprisingly, they were doing an article about the Rebbe. Not a Jewish magazine. And then Gabriel Aram was doing a, an article about the Rebbe. Why? In honor of the Rebbe's upcoming 90th birthday. The Rebbe's birthday, Yud Aleph Nissen. So this was Tov Shin Nun Beis. It was, like I said, the 26th of others. So you're talking about a little over two weeks later would be the Rebbe's 90th birthday. So they had an article coming out for the Rebbe's 90th birthday. So Gabriel Aram comes to get dollars from the Rebbe and uh, says, we have this upcoming article. We'd like to include a quote, a statement from the Rebbe. So what is the Rebbe's statement in honor of his 90th birthday? The Rebbe says, it's in, it's in English. You could, you could watch it. It's on video. It's in English. The Rebbe says, 90, right? The Rebbe's turning 90. 90 is tzaddik. Right? In, in Hebrew, each letter has a, a gematria, a numerical value. So 90 is tzaddik. And this is an indication that every single Jew can be a tzaddik. See what happened? This Jew comes and says, Rebbe, we want to make an article about the Rebbe. We want to pay tribute to the Rebbe. We want to talk about the greatness of the Rebbe. And the Rebbe flips it on him. No, 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 it's not about me. It's about you. I'm the tzaddik? No, no, no. <laughs> You're the tzaddik. Each and every one of you is the tzaddik. It wasn't a one-time thing, by the way. Before this sikha that we watched, earlier that year, Hashayna Rabba, last night of Sukkot, the Rebbe said that every single Jew has the title of Rebbe. You can go look it up. Yeder Yid hat the koyach v'espashtus von titul admur. Every Jew today has the power that is invested by having the title of Admur, Rebbe. So if you thought until now you're going to just have your life and have your Gashmias and have your Ruchnias and be a good Jew and that's enough and at the end of it all, at the F, F, after 120, you'll have a nice Gan Eden. No, I'm sorry. You don't get, the, you don't get, you don't have such a luxury. You are the leader of world Jewry. We're all waiting for you. Step up. It's not the Rebbe's job. It's your job. You look to your left. You look to your right. No, the buck stops here. It's your job. You're the tzaddik. You're the Rebbe. And that was the revolution. So what does that mean? These are lofty words. Practically speaking. It means that Mashiach is deeply personal. That when I think of my life, when I think of my story, each one of us has a story. Each one of us was born into a particular family at a particular time, had a particular upbringing. We went through different challenges. We had good times. We had hard times. You know your story. When you think about your story, 
your story and the story of the entire universe are one story. And they have one destiny. And your fulfillment, your accomplishment as an individual is the exact same idea as the perfection of the entire universe. In fact, the entire Seder is Talshus, because Mashiach isn't just for the physical world, Mashiach is for every Eilam. So your entire life is about the perfection of all the Eilamites. Is that grandiose? Yeah, it's grandiose, but we didn't think of it. The Rebbe revealed it about us. The Rebbe told us who we really are. We thought we were schleppers. The Rebbe revealed that we are kings. We are leaders. We care for the entire universe. And just like the Rebbe showed us what is a true leader, a true leader is somebody who can't rest until everybody else feels what he feels and cares for what he cares for and knows what he knows. So that I've been modeled for us what it means for us to step into our own royalty and our own kingship, our own, our own leadership. It's to care about the fact that there's a world of people who need to know the truth. Now that could be on many levels. It could be you meet a Jew who doesn't even know about basic mitzvah observance. So surely it's obvious then what message you need to bring to such a Jew. But you know, it could be an observant Jew who still thinks that you live and you learn and you daven, you do mitzvahs and you give a little tzedakah or even a lot of tzedakah and, and you have a nice Jewish home and that's it. What, who could ask for more? And you have to explain to this Jew, we're waiting for you. <laughs> the world is waiting for you to step into the spotlight and to take responsibility and come up with your plan. How are you going to perfect the universe? Don't tell me about your Gan Eden. Like Rabbi Kotlarski said earlier tonight, that Levi Yitzchak Berdichever said that he's not going to go into Gan Eden because he's going to wait to bring Mashiach for the rest of us down here. And that's what all the tzaddikim always pledged. That's what they always cared. They didn't want their own paradise, their own reward. They wanted to make it good down here. Okay, okay, tzaddik. I'm talking to you, tzaddik. You don't care about a good life in this world or even a good life in the next world. All you care about and all you will be content with is the perfection of the universe that is readily apparent and obvious for every single person to see. All flesh will see. Everyone will see. It will become empirically evident and obvious. Even science will prove that there's nothing but godliness. And you will not be content until you make that a reality. So step up. Own it. It's who you are. It's your destiny. Be real. Be you. Be true to yourself. Oh
Charlie was talking about the mitzvah to peace of the Yeshua. And this whole keenness, this whole night, was an outcry to Kaddish Baruch Hu, to commit Sapim and Mekavim. So I want to share with you, just for a few minutes, my own, my own outcry, my own feeling. There came a time in his life where every single talk that he gave, every single postic that he opened up to in Chumash, she was saying all kinds of Ramosim, hints, gematrias, Rashi about Mashiach. Everything was Mashiach, everything was Gula. And his Heiliger brother, Rabbi Yitzchak from Square, asked him what is going on, what's happening? And the Triska Maggid said, what can I do? Every single time I open the Chumash and I look inside, every single time I look inside, every single Pesach that I open up to, it becomes so clear to me, it's so obvious to me, the Mashiach must come now. I see it in every single Pesach. And I... Say, Takarish Borhu Abba Tat in Himmel Father. It says clearly in your Torah. In every single Pasik, it says the Mashiach has to come, that it's time for Gaula. So his brother, Rabbi Yitzhak Sfer, heard this. And his brother said, Avramala, these days you don't have to look in every Pasik in Chumash, you don't have to bring a Rai from Chumash. Just look at every single Jewish heart. Just look at every broken heart. And you see from every heart that you're looking at, the Mashiach has to come now. And we're living in such a time where every single day, the people who I'm talking to, the Jews that I'm hearing, you don't need to have all kinds of Muslim psukim. The hearts are crying out that we can't go on like this. The Mashiach must come. I would say 50 years ago or so, I was by the Rebbe, I was here for Slichus. And I went shopping a little bit on Kingston Avenue in this farm store. And they bought an old copy of the pre Tzaddik from the Korean from Lublin, Rebbe Tzaddik from HaKorin from Lublin. And I was looking ahead to Rosh Hashanah and it was a sentence that I saw that changed my life. Absodic writes, They heard from the Holy Rabbi of Ishbitz. That since the time that the Asik, the business of the Heilige Baal Shem, was revealed in the world, that is the Hisnoitzitzus, that spark, that awakening of Mashiach, the Asa Kabosha. And we find this in, in Shavis Yisrael from the Vladnikir, from Rebbe Chaz and many, many Sadiqim, and then the Siyim from Chabad, Bein Ahem. This Asa from the Bosha, the Rebbe Tzadik calls the Asa Kabosha, means many things. The Asa Kabosha means Simcha, it means Bittel, it means Nagina, it means Ahavis Yisrael, it means his Boininus, it means his Boidudus, it means many, many things. But the Pneumius of that Asik, of the Baal Shem HaKadosh, 
is found in the Lushan of the Rambam by the Siyam now that's taking place. But the Rambam writes at the end, the only business of the world that's going to be. It's Ladas is Hashem to know God. Ladas is Hashem Bilvad. And then he ends, of course, with the Posik, Kimolar is Des Hashem, Kemaim Liamachas. Ladas is Hashem Bilvad. Ladas is Hashem, like we learned in Tanya today in Membeis. The das of the Rayim him of Moshe Rabbeinu that's inside each and every one of us. La das is Hashem means das is his kashvis, is connecting, is a deep connection. La das is Hashem bilvat. And that doesn't only mean knowing Hashem, but it means recognizing and knowing the Hashem, the Lakus, in every single person that we meet, in our own children, in each other, husbands and wives, parents and children. The Alter Rebbe look at the Torah and Achrei Mois. X, how is it possible? What does it mean to do tshuva? Tshuva means to return. But let's also pull the meaning. What does it mean to return to God? God is everywhere. How do you return to him? He never left you. He's everywhere. So what does it mean to do tshuva, to return to him? So Alter Rebbe explains that there are two kinds of relationships. There's panim al panim, and there's achor b'achor. We know this from the Ksavim. There are two ways of relating to each other in Tukhadosh Baruch Hu, one is face to face and the other is back to back. You could have a husband and wife that are living in the same house for 20, 30, 40 years. They raise children together. They go to Simchas, they make Simchas together, but they're not really facing each other. There's really that das, that knowledge, that awareness, that hiskashvis, that presence of the Rayim, him, the, of Moshe Rabbeinu, of das is missing, is not there. And the Navi cries out, Jews are keeping mitzvahs. Jews are keeping Shabbos. But they're missing this das, this awareness, this connection, this looking for HaKadosh Baruch Hu, this ponim al ponim. The tefillah that we're talking about tonight, this outcry, the urgency of every mitzvah, the Rebbe's call, all that we're discussing, all that we're davening for is one thing. As panecha Hashem avakesh, al taster panecha mimen. As panecha Hashem avakesh, Hashem, I'm looking for you in every Jew that I meet. I'm looking for you. I'm looking for you in my kids. I'm looking for you in my husband. I'm looking for you in my wife. I'm looking for you in myself. As panecha Hashem avakesh, al taster panecha mimen. I heard once from my daughter when she was a little girl a story. I don't know if it ever happened. I've shared it many times. That over 100 years ago, I don't think it's true, but some story that over 100 years ago in London there was a, there was a poetry competition. Well, the Americans are busy with the Yankees and the Bulls, and in England they were having poetry competitions. And the three finalists were on the stage, and there were hundreds of people, fine English people in the audience, and there were judges, and the last the last poem that was given to be recited was Psalm 23, which we know, Hashem is my shepherd, and if I have Hashem, then nothing in my life is missing. I have everything. I'm not afraid. And that was the last poem. And each one recited it. And the third fellow was a young guy, and he did a beautiful job. It was very, very good. And it was clear that he was going to win. Judging by the approval of the audience, he was the winner, hands down. And all of a sudden, somewhere in the audience, an old man got up with a long beard, an Eastern European Jew got up and called out, judges, judges, could you give me a chance to try? Let me try. And they thought this would be an amusing way to end the evening by making fun of a Jew. And they said, sure, and the old man got up and he began in broken English to recite Kapitel of Gimel. At the beginning, people were smirking, they were smiling. By the time that he was finished, many people were crying. And the event was over, they're walking out, and the young guy got the, got the award, and they're heading out. 
and the young man is walking with the old rabbi, and the young man says, you know, rabbi, the truth is you deserve the award. And the rabbi says, I wasn't competing. And the young man asked him, tell me, rabbi, why is it that when I finished the 23rd Psalm, the entire audience was cheering? But when you finished, there was silence and there were tears. And the old Rav said, my friend, you did a beautiful job, but there's a very big difference between the two of us. The difference is that I know the shepherd. That's the difference. I know the shepherd. Hashem Rory, Hashem is my shepherd. Chevre, if you don't feel that, if we're not in that place of knowing the shepherd, if we're not in that place of Espanecha, Hashem, Avakesh, how are we supposed to bring that out in others? And how are we supposed to avoid the recitation of Yiddishkeit, that our davening, our learning, our mitzvahs are not just reciting, but they're being said as love songs to Kaddish Baruch Hu. It has to do with the way that we talk to each other. To bring Mashiach in such a way to that, come to that point of Umolar's day as Hashem. I'll end with a story that all of you know, know much better than me. And I'm nervous to say a Maisa from the Frida Garebi in front of you. But this is the way that I heard it. So I'm sure you'll all correct me. But this is the way that I saw it in some safer. You know, in 1929, the Frida Garebi Yelena was in Eretz Yisrael. He left a short time, it was right before the pogrom that happened in Hebron. And it was just a day or two before the Friedrich Rebbe was leaving, he was in Yerushalayim. And there were hundreds and hundreds of people that were converging on the place that he was staying, looking for a bracha, looking for chizik. Many of the old Hasidim who came to Israel were there. And there was this one Jew who had formerly been a Chabad Chosid back in the Haim, but he came to Israel, you know, that time of the Chalutzim, and later on, there was a certain pioneering spirit. Oftentimes, the mitzvahs were abandoned. And this fellow, it seems, was not really keeping things anymore. He came from a prominent Lubavitcher family. I don't know his name. And he had heard that the Frida Garebi was, was there. And it happened that that street where the Rebbe was staying was the place to which he would pass in order to get to work every day. But now he was afraid. He saw all the chassidim there and he was afraid somebody might, might, might recognize it even without a beard. And he was walking around in a pair of shorts and sandals. And he was afraid maybe somebody would recognize him and be embarrassing for him and for his family. So he avoided the rabbi, he avoided going there. But then there was a sign that he saw. So he would go around the corner. Every day he would make a long circuit around the corner. And finally he saw a sign and he understood it was the last day that the rabbi was there. And how is it possible for an old Lubavitcher Chassid, no matter what he's wearing, no matter what he's doing or not doing, to keep himself away from the Rebbe? So what happened? This Yid, finally, with his shorts and his sandals and his cut-out uh, T-shirt, so the fellow goes in, the fellow goes in, pushes his way. I see them all looking. They don't recognize him. He has his eyes down. He pushes his way. He became already Israeli enough to do that, and he pushed his way right into the Rebbe. And the Rebbe looked at him in the eyes. And the Rebbe recognized him right away. And the Rebbe said, We make circles, we go around, we dray around. Once we dray around twice. A soif in the end. But a In the end, everybody comes back. In the end, for sure, for sure, I knew you would come. Dressed this way, dressed that way. But in the end, I knew you would come. Chavre. We're draying a hen and a hair. The day is coming. Hina yom and boim. And each one of us is going to be as Hashem to look at Mashiach in the eyes. It's happening. That's what we're talking about. That's why we're here. It's happening. And we're going to look at Mashiach in the eyes. And Mashiach is going to smile and say, and You wandered around so many years. But I knew in the end you would come back. Our job is not to wait for that day. Our job is... Umolar is Deus Hashem now, to fill the world with Deus Hashem. So each and every one of us will be proud to look at Mashiach in the eyes and to be Zoycha for that day. Ki Ayin, Ba'ayin, Yeru, Beshuva Hashem, Tzion, Begul Hashem, Amitis, Amen, Amen. Tzavah, Tzavah,
There's two bottles on this table. It's too much for us, but it's not enough for everyone, you know? So, Alright, so you know, this whole maimid, this whole gathering, this whole get-together has been, as it's been discussed, as it's been explained, it's about one thing, and one thing alone, which is about drawing out that desire, that fila, that wanting, that thirst for geula. And I'll tell you the truth, and it's also been mentioned that there is minias, there could be some obstacles along the way that we have to break through, we have to go over. And so I'll tell you something, for me personally, I was a Ferbengus, so will be personal, for me personally, to me there's one minia, for me personally. And it's two words, each one of, each word by itself is a holy, Jewish, beautiful word. But you put them together, to me, it becomes one of the darkest sentences in, uh, in all of language, and that's Eurydice Adairis. Eurydice Adairis. We know there's such a thing, there's such a phenomenon, you can't deny such a thing. That as the generations go on, as we move farther and farther away from Har Sinai, the collective Koiches HaNefesh, the powers of understanding Torah, of pouring one's heart out and davening, they seem to be diminished. And you know, it's an amazing thing as we get even closer to Mashiach and we move further and further in into that tekufa that's called, that's defined as Ikvaz de Mashiach, then the Yerid of the descent, the shrinking of the souls of the generation, it seems to be, in the language of Chassidus, I guess, it's Shaloi Ke'erech. It's not Seder Hishtal Shalos. It's not a usual descent from one level to the next to the next. It, it drops off a cliff. Anyone that's in any position of uh, leadership knows that the generations, you know, that every every two years is a new generation, and it's the Eridus Adoris that exists is Shloike Erech. It's without measure. It doesn't fit the normal pattern of of just one degree less. 
And ironically, and ironically, that major task of pushing us over the threshold of Geula is ironically given to the weakest of generations, the generation that compared to the earlier ones is mamish nothing. So to me, that's Akasha. To me, that's Akasha. How do we overcome that? And we have to understand that when, you know, like the Gemara says that before the Rabbani Shalom gave Moshe Rabbeinu the Torah, the Malachim in heaven, the angels in heaven had Akasha, Ma'enesh Kisiz Karenu, what is the human being worth that you should give him such a gift? When the Malachim had such a question, that's not just something that happened once upon a time that's recorded in the Gemara and we review it. That's an ongoing question that sometimes plagues the mind of a Jew. Ma'enesh Kisiz Karenu, what value do you have? How is it possible that such a task that we saw from the video, the Rebbe himself, uh, to, 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 be, to, give, to be given over to Igrus of the Mashiach is such a thing. How, how can we handle such a thing? How can, we, how can we make sense of it? All right, so listen, so I'm no one, I'm no one worthy of giving explanations, giving Biurim, but, you know, even an Amaretz can, like, bump into a truth once in a while, you know, so it's, just, you know, it's not so crazy if what I'm about to say is maybe true. And even if it's not B'dars Tefillah, like Rabbi Wamgar mentioned, to speak with Taras Tefillah. So it's like this. It's, an, it's not a simple idea, but I'm going to try to package it as concisely and as simply and as quickly as possible. In the writings of the Rishonim, it goes back to Rishonim already, the Ravid in a number of places. It's mentioned in the Zara Kaddish in a few places. In the Beis of the Vilna Gai, in the writings of the Groh Alpi Kabbalah, this is expanded upon in great detail is that the Rishonim tell us the tradition is as follows, that one of the major maniyas for Geula is not necessarily like a certain date that the Rabbani Shalom has, okay, this is going to be the date, you know, and so on. There is a requirement, and it's going to sound a little bit funny, there is a requirement for Nishmas Moshe Rabbeinu, for the soul of Moshe Rabbeinu to make its way into the world a certain number of times. And in order for Gula to take place, Nishmas Moshe, the soul of Moshe Rabbeinu, has to be fully unpackaged and fully expressed. And that takes many times. And the Sram talk about this a certain number of times, when I can go into the how many times and so on. In order for Nishmas Moshe to come, Gula, just like Moshe Rabbeinu was the first redeemer, Gula depends on the soul of Moshe Rabbeinu. Now Moshe Rabbeinu's neshama, that's, that's, a, that's a big neshama, you know? That's, talked about Yerida Sadaris, just like the last generation is, you know, a drop off a cliff down, Moshe Rabbeinu is not just uh, the highest in Seder Stalshas. Moshe Rabbeinu is, Moshe Rabbeinu is very, very big. And Moshe Rabbeinu's soul has to come down X number of times for Gula to take place. As I mentioned, this is something that we find in many Sfarim. You know, there's a, there's a mice they say from Rav Nachman Haradanka, that he was one of the Talmud of Shem. And uh, he had, he was thinking about making Aliyah, going to Eretz Yisrael. And so he asked his Rebbe, he asked the Baal Shem Tev, and the Baal Shem Tev said, go to the mikveh, go to the mikveh, and an answer will come. So he goes to the mikveh, and he dunks into the mikveh, and when he dunks the first time, he sees himself in Yerushalayim, okay? He dunks again, he sees himself in Beis HaMikdash. He dunks a third time. He's in Kodesh HaKadshim, but there's no Aaron. There's no Aaron, okay? So he goes back to the Baal Shem, and the Baal Shem Tev says like this, the Baal Shem Tev says, you go to Eretz Yisrael, it's fine, you can find the Beis HaMikdash, but the Aaron is in Mezhevish. The Aaron is in Mezhevish. We know that the Baal Shem Tev, the whole Taras of Baal Shem Tev, as was mentioned, is the Indian of Taras HaMashiach. The Aaron is that vessel that's Moshe Rabbeinu. Like the Rambam writes in Pirish Mishnayis that there was only one person that was able to go into Kaddish HaKadjim at will. Not Yom Kippur, nothing, just whenever he wanted, that was Moshe Rabbeinu. Mi bein shnei hakruvim. It says in Pasuk that the Rabbani Shalom speaks to Moshe from between the two cherubs. Mi bein shnei hakruvim is Rosh HaTavis Moshe. So this idea of Geula being the emergence of Moshe Rabbeinu, as is mentioned by the Zar Kaddish, the Vilna Gain, and so on, this is echoed by the Baal Shem Tev in his language, that his Torah, which is Torah the Mashiach, is the Bechin of the Aaron. So here's the problem, just to make the problem even worse. So if the ultimate task that we have, that we're charged with, is to bring Geula, which means to somehow embody Nishmas Moshe, Saif B'Kasha. Mele, if you're born with a big Neshama, like the Lubavitcher Rebbe, you know, or a Tzadik Yisod Olam, in whatever the generation might be. So that, those are big Neshamas. Those are Moshe Rabbeinu Dikin Neshamas. Mele. 
But for every single one of us to be given that task to bring Gula within ourselves, and Gula depends on Nishmas Maisha, how could such a thing be? How could such a thing be? So you read this at Doris, it's one thing if there's a certain quote of mitzvahs, but, but now we're saying that it has to be that you have to literally embody the greatest neshama of all time of Maisha Rabbeinu. And, by the way, you read this at Doris. So how is that possible? I better not stop now, right? That's like, I have to give an answer. All right, so there's an idea that we find in the Sarmak Daishem. It's talked about by the Rashash, the base medrash of the Sfaradish and Kabbalim. It's expounded upon and unpackaged by the Taras Chacham, Rechaim de la Rose, in that, in that world. The following idea is said, and it's as follows. There are two categories of neshamas. There's one category of neshamas, which is that every individual neshama has its designated madrega and designated kaychas. And within that category of neshamas, that every single one, every single individual is a designated, designated neshama, you're coming from, you have a, a tremendous amount of chesed, or a tremendous amount of gavur, or a tremendous amount of, of beauty, whatever the midas are, whatever the particular madrega is, that's your, that's your neshama. And within that category, there is the biggest of all, and that's my Rabbeinu. But Seder Rashash has another category of neshamas. And this other category of neshamas, when you look at each and, one, each and every one of them, you know what madrega they have? They have madrega of nothing. Of nothing. Now that's... Who has those neshamas? That's because of Mashiach. That's the generation before Mashiach comes. If you want to identify where, what's your madrega, where you're holding? Nothing. But you know... But here's the irony. The Rashash taught us that that itself, which is an unbelievable, maybe weakness in those neshamas, is its greatest strength. Do you know why? Because it says in Pasuk, that Chazal say, is shakul keneged kol Yisrael, that Moshe Rabbeinu equals all 600,000 yidin, which means that there is a way to duplicate Nishmas Moshe. And that is by not having your own personal madrega. That all you are is nothing but an empty space within which the collective powers of all of Klai Yisrael is able to pool, concentrate, and express itself. And you know what the irony is? It's Davka Nishamas that when you identify them and you want to say, like, what's your color? What's your inion? What's your madrega? And the answer is, I got nothing. Those are specifically the neshamas that are custom-made to be just pools, to be just places in which the collective energy of Kala Yisrael is able to manifest. And this is one of the most essential terrorists of, of Chassidus, which is Fabrengen, of Yidin coming together, and all of a sudden, every single individual person has their limitations, and maybe extremely, extreme limitations. But it's because of our own personal nothingness that we're able to do a mitzvah, and we can say, the Rabbi Shlolem, who am I? I'm Mamish nothing. But you know who I'm doing this mitzvah on behalf of? You know, who I, you know what I want to embody? You know what I want to, to, to be activated through me? I am doing this, the shame call Yisrael, on behalf of all of Kal Yisrael. And we talked about, how we saw from the videos and, and so on, spreading the light and connecting to another Yid, and focusing on being mashpia to other Yidin. A hundred million percent, that's, that's, that's everyone's achrayas. But even in a situation of where you're, you're daving your own Shem Nesrei, there is a way of daving your own personal Shem Nesrei, of learning your own Pasuk in Chomish, saying a Perak Tehillim, even daving for your own Inyanim, where you say to yourself, Rabbanu Shalom, I don't have the strength nor the desire to come to you as just me individually. Because me individually, who am I? But Adarab. Because who I am is mamish nothing, I am able to say, Rabbani Shloylam, I am emptying myself out of my own personal color, of my own personal madrega, my own personal shayrish, and I am going to act as just a klal, just a way through which klal Yisrael can speak to you through me. And all I want to be is nothing but a mouthpiece for the millions of Yidin out there that can't talk to you directly or don't know that they can't talk to you directly. And even the Yidin that can't speak to you directly, I want to just be a, a pool within which Klal Yisrael's energy is able to concentrate. 
and it's bodek and it's tested and proven that tzaddikim have told us this, that even yidin, davke yidin, who in their own personal madregas might be extremely limited, but if they embrace an avodas Hashem, that's one of 600,000 yidin serving the Rabbani Shalom through them, and seeing yourself as just part of that collective whole of Klai Yisrael, and you're able to do that specifically because of the fact that you are completely transparent and translucent and a bechin of ayin and a mamish of nothingness. So the, the, the kaiches that could come out of you and the kaiches that could be manifest through you are shaloi ke'erech, are completely transcendent from the limitations that you might be as an individual person. There is a way, davka, specifically, ironically, it's specifically because of Yudas Hadaris. It's specifically because of the limitations of each one of us as an individual person. It's davka because of that that we could all collectively be the Maish Rabbeinus and allow that Nakud of Maish Rabbeinu, that Nakud of the Raya Mehemna, the trusted shepherd, the, poor, the, the Yechidish Abinefesh to express itself by us coming to Rabbanishim and saying, Rabbanishim, I'm not davening to you because of, because of my name and because of who I am, as if I'm an individual person just coming. Rabbanishim, I'm coming to you on behalf of all of Klai Yisrael. And it sounds silly, like presumptuous, who are you? The answer is, exactly, I'm nothing. I'm nobody. That's exactly why I'm the perfect person to be the vessel for all of Klai Yisrael to come to you. And the Klai Yisrael Nefesh, an individual can, in, can absorb and, be, and transmit even to others is unbelievably, unbelievably, infinitely compounded because of this. And this is exactly what the Aran is. What's the Aran? The Aran is Einam and Amida. We know one of the miracles of the Aran in the Kodesh HaKadshim is that it didn't take up any space. Like you measured from one side of the room to the other and so on, it didn't take up any physical space. The question is, Mepharsh and Mask, God doesn't do miracles for nothing. Who's noticing that? The Kain Gadol and Kaddish HaKadshim is the only one that goes in once a year and he's not taking measuring sticks. Why would God do this miracle for nothing? The answer is, it's not a miracle. That's what the Aaron is. The Aaron is nothing. And that's exactly, exactly why it's able to be the source of divine light into the world because it's nothing. Every single one of us, we know our deficiencies. We know our chesroinus. And the Yetzirah tells us, because you're chesroinus, because of your deficiencies, who are you to daven? Who are you to learn? Who are you to tell other yidin about davening and learning? Who are you to give chizik to other yidin? Who are you to talk about gula, to talk about Mashiach, to take upon yourself avoid of afatas miyanis? Who are you? So what's the response of the Eight Sahara? The response is, exactly, exactly, exactly. Exactly what Moshe Rabbeinu said to the Malachim. Malachim said, you have all these problems. Moshe Rabbeinu said, exactly, exactly. Because we're nothing, because we're ayin, Mamish Ayan, because of that, Ain Saif, infinite, infinite Kaiches can pour to the world through us. This is what you find by all the tzaddikim. Everyone talked, everyone talked about this. Even the great Rosh Hashiva of pre war Europe, you know, Rosh Shimon Shkop in his Akdamat to Shari Yosher, he talks about this. He says that the key of Avodis Hashem is what? Is redefining your sense of self, expanding the I of who you are. When a baby is born, a baby is little, what is I? When the baby says I, what does it mean? It means him or her. When it gets a little bit older, what does I mean? It means the family. You get married, it means your wife. Shimon said, a big tzaddik, you know what I means? I means Kal Yisrael. And that could happen in two ways. Either you're given Nishmas Moshe, top of the Everest, or your mom is nothing, and all you are is a pool within which the kaiches of Kal Yisrael are able to concentrate. Bez Hashem, we shall be saich in our own lives. Mashiach Bez Hashem should manifest in an open and revealed way, Bekarif, Mamish. But the Iker is that a person should have the Moichen of Mashiach, the Moichen of Gula in their own lives. And the Moichen of Mashiach, the Moichen of Gula means to be able to do everything B'Shem Kol Yisrael. Just to end off with a quick story. You know, there's a, a Maisa of a Yid, very, very quickly, a Maisa of a Yid that he once had a lot of problems, a lot of tsaras, whatever it is, you know, a whole peck of stuff. And he went to the Rizhner to get a bracha. And so he had to wait on a long line to get the Rizhner. Eventually he gets the Rizhner. And the Rizhner, you know, he pours his heart out. And the Rizhner says, Eivish is elfin. Hashem should help. Finished. And like that, you know. He was hoping for something a little bit more than that. So he leaves the room. And so one of the sons of the Rizhner saw that this year leaves the Rebbe's office, the Rebbe's study, and his face is down. That's not the way it's supposed to be. 
So he asks him what happened. So the person says, you know, I was hoping for a little bit more than just Abish is an elephant. So he goes back. So, the, 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 so he says like this, go back to my, go back online, go back to my father and say, Rebbe, what's going to be until the Abish helps? So he goes back in. Okay, it's a good question. So he goes and he goes in. And he says, you know, I came before, and the Rebbe gave me a bracha, Abish's elephant, but I want to know, what's going to be biz Abish's elephant? What's going to be until that? And the original said, the Abish's elephant, biz Abish's elephant. So that's not like, you know, pushing him to the side. That's a big bracha. That's a big bracha. To have moichin of Mashiach, to have moichin of Mashiach, and to be able to say to yourself that I embrace that avayda of living b'shem kol Yisrael, of living... Mullard's day session Kamai Mamachasma being a little Aranakaidish, which is Mamish nothing but through me can be manifest Mamish ain't saif. That's a life worth living. Hashem shall bless each and every one of us that we shall be Zaikha to experience a Gula Pratis, the Bani Chaim Izaini. But whenever the Rabbani Shalom gives brachas to Yidin, Bani Chaim Izaini, it's always with his stamp, you know, it's always Ba'etzam Alakus. Just packaged in Bani Chaim Azani. The Ikir Bracha is that a person should be Zaycha to receive Elokos, to receive the Rabbanu Shalom himself. And Bekelem, Bekelem, Shayim, in all sorts of ways with Bani Chaim Azani, we shall be Zaycha to experience a Gula Pratis, and, and, and through that, a Gula, a Gula, a Gula Klolis. May it be called Tzadik Barachimim, may it be Amen.
Thank you for joining in tonight's program. Continue the inspiration and join us for a roundtable for Bregan with Rabbi Simon Jacobson and Rabbi Levi Gorelick. Make your way through the Mashiach Fair into the parking lot. The Fabregen Room is straight ahead. Special thank you to our presenters, Rabbi Moshe Kotlarski, Rabbi Manus Friedman, Rabbi Aaron Ginsberg, Rabbi Simon Jacobson, Rabbi Levi Gorelick, Rabbi Moshe Weinberger, Rabbi Shays Taub, Rabbi Yossi Zakutinsky, Mr. Charlie Harari, Rabbi Usher Fetterman, Mr. Beryl Solomon, Rabbi David Tachtel, Mr. Sam Stelzer, and Mr. Isaac Faulati. I give him Cosay, say you who shall let him fall in. I give him Cosay, say you Shall <laughs> 